daughter, Anna Marie, married, of course, to Leo, Olga's son, Rocky, Francisco, and his third wife, Norma Cruz, and her sons, Haxel, married to Diane, and Alex, Jamie. His grandchildren include Peter, Ricardo, Manuel, Gabrielle, Gladys, Mark, Kelly, and Ricky. Great-grandchildren, Crystal, Victoria, Anna, and Peter. Ricardo emigrated from Cuba in the mid-1950s in search of medical assistance for his son. From age 14, he trained and worked as a mechanical engineer, later becoming chief engineer. He had a strong work ethic, which he duly instilled in his children. He set out for Spain in search of his paternal family at age 70. Arriving in Villacha, he discovered that the town had many residents that shared his last name. He located his father's birthplace and childhood home, as well as his remaining aunts, uncles, and cousins. Throughout his life, Ricardo was a family man dedicated to helping his family in any way he could. The Lord called Ricardo home on Friday, March 28th this year, 2014, at St. Alphonse's Hospital in Boise, Idaho. And we are here to give thanks to the Lord for his life and the blessings that the Lord has bestowed upon him. At this time, Anna, if you're ready, I invite you to come forward and to share with the group gathered here the letter. This is a note from uh, my sister, Madeline, who's in Tucson. <clears throat> my father left Cuba in the mid-1950s and spent his young adult life in New York City to seek specialized medical attention for my brother, Louis. He was also called Mimo, short for my hermanito. If the transition daunted him, he would not know it. One month after his arrival in the cold of winter, which coming from Cuba, very different, he entered the cafe he had had his eye on for months. For a month. Tonight, tonight's special was pork chops with applesauce. He tried again and again to place an order with the waitress, but finally ended up pointing to the entree he wanted. He hoped his accent didn't prevent him from being misunderstood. Instead, by the next day, he learned it was not his accent that prevented him from being understood, but rather he had moved into a Polish community and learned not a month's worth of English, but a month's worth of Polish instead. <laughs> As a toddler, I would run outside waiting my dad to come home from work. The New York subway would leave him just two blocks from home. Arriving on my street, I was allowed to go greet him. Each night, in his pocket, he carried a surprise. A red cellophane-covered packet of two filled mints from the Algonquin Hotel where he worked. Although his work as a chief engineer was exhausting, he would spend time with me in the evenings playing, often performing coin tricks. My father, an outgoing and charismatic man, befriended several Cuban families in town. Never a weekend would pass without a picnic, a celebration, an outing. Our summers were spent in Cunningham Park, Jones Beach, Seaside Heights, and our winters in the Catskills. Our American, holiday, our American holidays were prepared in Cuban tradition with roast suckling pig and turrones from Spain. When my father formed a new family with Olga, my sister Anna, and my stepbrother Rocky, 
also went to Jones Beach and spent much time together at Flushing Meadows Park. As my father's life slowed into retirement pace, I listened to the colorful stories behind his sayings about his life in Cuba. We might say here in the US, such and such will happen, God's willing. But the translation of my dad saying, si Dios quiere la vaca pinta, means such and such will happen, God's willing, and the speckled cow allow. Between the two Cuban farm towns in which my father and mother Gladys lived was a transom in the field of speckled cows. As my father explained, if the cow didn't allow it, he would not pass. So there came his speckled cow saying. When he lived with me in Los Angeles and in Tucson, my father and I cooked together and we shared his recipes. After he moved, he was a telephone call away and he was a telephone call away to talk me through the most challenging of home repairs. On a phone call from the top of a ladder, a 10 foot ladder, as I rewired the ceiling fan, or on another call from below the sink where plumbing was stopped up, and yet another call before a water heater whose pilot had gone out when the pipes froze. To the last of his breaths, my father engaged freely in conversation and jokes, as evidenced by a nurse who was by his side at the time he passed. During his last years, my father hoped to gain sufficient strength to return to Spain, where he had spent a month at a time in camaraderie, sharing and listening to family stories. Torn by his family situation in Cuba, he helped as often and as best as he could, making arrangements for my cousin Carela to emigrate. My dad will be pleased to be amongst our big family in Spain, again, which he longed, loved, and learned and yearned to know. It is rare to find anyone in Valacha who isn't an Espanera. As I say goodbye to the physical presence and send him off to embrace, to be embraced by, by God and our ancestors, I say, this was one of my dad's sayings, so. One, two, three, go home going, one, two, three, go home puesto, si Dios quiere y la vaca pinta. When we gather together for a Christian funeral and when we mourn the loss of a loved one, it's a good thing to recall those memories, to rejoice and give thanks for those blessings. We're especially gathered here today to take all those blessings, all those memories, and especially give thanks because, as you said and as your sister wrote, to be embraced by the Lord it's more than just a nice thing to say. It's more than just an empty hope. It's the reality of the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life that he had received from his Creator and his Savior and whom he trusted in, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's that life that we are here to celebrate and that gift of eternal life that we're also here to give thanks you may follow along with the worship service as it's printed in the folder, or you may simply sit back and listen and follow along in your heart. I welcome each of you, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together to seek God's comfort in our sorrow, and to rejoice in the promise of the resurrection, grace and peace to you, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I invite you to join your hearts with mine in prayer. 
Lord Jesus, you wept at the grave of your friend Lazarus, and you consoled Mary and Martha in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for Ricardo. Dry the tears of all who weep. Calm our troubled hearts. Dispel our doubts and fears. And lead us to praise you for having brought him to faith. In your rising from the dead, you conquered death and opened the gates to eternal glory and life. Strengthen us with your word and lead us through this earthly life until at last we are united with you and all the saints in glory everlasting. Amen. I invite the congregation, if you feel comfortable doing so, to join with me in the reading of the 23rd Psalm. We read together, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <clears throat> the verses from Scripture that I have chosen to preach on at the event of Ricardo's funeral is recorded here in Romans chapter 5, verses 6, 7, and 8. The Apostle Paul was inspired to write, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I would not claim to share with you all the memories that you have, especially you, the members of the family, of, of knowing your father, your grandfather, your loved one. But as I've mentioned many times at many a funeral, one of the privileges of being a pastor is getting to know people very quickly, and for whatever reason, people are willing to share very openly when I begin to have a relationship with them. The situation that I had was that Ricardo, when he moved here and joined your family, he came along, came to church with you. And uh, I kind of chuckle now in hindsight when I was first getting to know him, shaking his hand, and Leo, I shared with you, I go, I I'd like to reach out and visit with your father-in-law, but my Spanish stinks, as many of you know from my reading of the obituary. And you gave me the encouragement, oh, he knows much more than he lets on. And so we visited, and I asked, could I ask him, I'd like to come and visit, and, and we got to know one another. And it was, as I said, a great joy. It was a great joy for a lot of different reasons, many of the reasons that you know, that are very similar to the more intense and abundant reasons that you have to, to remember him with joy. Um, it was always a joy to visit with him because especially when I would come out, um, I always made, he always made sure that I had a good cup of coffee. And then I would get a little bit of instruction of how to make a good cup of coffee. And how you make it this way and not that way, and this is the way it worked. And I will testify, it was really good. So I always had my cup of coffee, and I would visit with him. And of course, our purpose was, and I realized this was a man who loved his Lord, 
because he did not object. In fact, he was eager to sit down and open up the scriptures and talk about what God had to say. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit in just a little bit, but not only did I have the cup of coffee with him, I also enjoyed spending time with him because, well, to be honest with you, as I was reading through the obituary, I went, yeah, I remember him telling me about that, and I was listening to your letter, and I remember him talking about working at the hotel, and many things that were not mentioned. And as those of you who know me, I enjoy history, whether it's studying it in a class, but I really enjoy history when I hear it from the person who lived it. And so we had wonderful times. He told me about his life in Cuba, working in the sugar mill. He told me, he would always tell me, and even in fact the last time I visited him, just remembering how he could even climb to the highest point and just up on the beam, take a nap, and he would never fall off. That was something that was very special to him. And even because I would often visit him riding on my motorcycle, he told me about how he would ride a motorcycle or had the opportunity to ride a motorcycle in Cuba. Many interesting things. But what kept coming up again and again, even as he described to me and shared with me some of his struggles, and I had never heard about the learning Polish, but that was interesting as I heard him describe his life and the many blessings and also his many struggles, what came out again and again was a man who as he grew in his life and in his exposure to the Bible began to realize and boldly confess more and more, God's been good to me. God has been good to me. I didn't see it when it was happening. I didn't understand it at that time. God was good to me. And in fact, the reason that this text, I chose this text, was because I will always remember, and he was such a great example of a Christian who boldly confessed this, as the Apostle Paul says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He often confessed to me and said, you know, even when I wasn't very good, even when, and as I said, people confide in their pastor, even when I did really bad things, God was good to me. See, that's the man that I will always remember in the Christian faith that I will always remember being confessed is that he knew who God was. Boy, when we got on that topic, he made it very clear. God is God. He is holy. Nobody messes with him. And on the few occasions as we visited and studied the Bible together, he would, he would come up with something and I would have to say, well, that's not exactly how I read it in the Bible. And then we would open up the scriptures together and we would have our two languages and, and he'd actually have two Bibles opened up, one in Spanish and another one in English and, and I'd have a different English translation and we'd look at that and he'd study it and many a time, every time that came up, when he realized that what he had been thinking or what he understood was not exactly in line with the Bible and he would see it there in the black and white and we'd talk about it, then he would stop and go, oh, well, if that's what the Bible says, if that's what God says, that's the way it is. Because he knew who his God was. A holy and perfect God. A God who spoke clearly in his word. A God who should be listened to. And a God who should be respected. And he also knew, even as he shared, as I mentioned already, those times when he would share with me the struggles he went through, some of the things that he would even go, that wasn't the best way. He knew very clearly that that very same God that deserves all our respect, that very same God who has every right to judge, is the very same God who died for him. And in that time when I had to visit him at the hospital, that truth of knowing who God is and what God had done for him 
gave him a peace. In Utah, in the letter, and as was mentioned before, he was joyful, he was filled with happiness, witnessed by the nurses, the staff, the people at the hospital, and I witnessed it as well. He had that peace, that true peace in Jesus. As he was there in the hospital, which ended up being his last visit to the hospital, he told me once again, well, if I get better, I get better. If I stay here, I stay here. If I die, I go to the Lord. And it's all good. See, that's the faith of a Christian man who when he looks at himself, recognizes that there is no power in and of himself to save himself. When he looks at his many blessings that he has found, that he has been blessed with, that he has been given in his life, as he looks at his life and he sees the tragedies and the hardships and the joys and the blessings, and he looks at them all and he says, the joys and blessings are gifts from God, and the tragedies, God was blessing me then too by working things out for my good. And that is the blessing of a Christian life that when we know our time is coming to an end, we can sit there with peace and tranquility and even joy and say, it's all good. And that witness that I share with you is not just meant to be a witness to give you some comfort for a short time on a Sunday afternoon in the spring of the year. If you truly want to honor his life, if you really want to honor his memory, I feel very comfortable in saying that no greater honor could he receive. He would feel no greater honor than to be remembered as a man who trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and who wanted others to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as well. He was not a selfish man. And he certainly would not be selfish with the comfort of the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life found in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Today you will continue to shed tears. Today you will continue to express condolences. You will hug. You will encourage one another. And you will share stories. And believe me or not, even though it's probably difficult to feel at this time, there will come times when you will laugh and you will chuckle and you will rejoice in the memories that you have. But regardless of whether you're crying or whether you're laughing, whether it's in the peaceful moments of the evening or in the middle of, middle of a hectic day, you can take comfort in knowing that he knew his Lord and his Savior, that he knew what the Lord had done for him. And at this very moment, in, with the Lord, he is rejoicing and giving thanks. And that is the only true comfort that can overcome the sadness of a lost loved one. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This gives us peace and comfort here and now. It gives us the peace and comfort to even deal with the tragedy of death. And it gives us peace and comfort to face our own end and to look forward to the glory of eternal life, which is Ricardo's, now and forever. Amen. Once again, I invite the congregation to join your hearts with me in prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, we praise you for the great company of saints who have finished their lives in faith and now rest from their labors. We remember especially our loved one, Ricardo, whom you have redeemed by the blood of your son and received as your dear child through holy baptism. We thank you for giving him to us as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your compassion, comfort all who are sad in this hour. We praise you for your love in Christ, which sustains us in life and death. 
In our earthly sorrows, help us find strength in the fellowship of the church, joy in the forgiveness of sins, and hope in the resurrection to eternal life. You do not leave us comfortless, but strengthen and care for us through your word and sacrament. You give us family, friends, and neighbors to help where there is loneliness now and in the days to come. Brighten our future with a firm trust in your promise and care. Remove our fears and make us bold to pray with confidence as our Savior has taught us. And we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This time I invite the congregation to join with me in singing the hymn, Amazing Grace. The words are projected on the screen. The hymn is also found in the red hymnal, hymn 379. love of the Lord, who has blessed us with life, created this world, and sustains us each and every day, be with us. May the Lord God, who willingly came into this world and gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for sin once and for all, continue to assure us of that forgiveness. And may the Lord God, who brought us from death to life and gives us a hope of everlasting life, be with you now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.